China's far western Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region has traditionally suffered from poverty and a lack of development and educational resources. But the region has undergone major changes in recent years with efforts from both the government and society. The government's financial subsidies for students in low-income families, for example, have been increased to ensure children can access at least nine years of compulsory education. And non-public funded organizations such as Beijing Meijiang Education Foundation have also launched initiatives to help students in Xinjiang to receive better education. So what are the experiences of the students themselves? What's it like to be a Uyghur student studying in Beijing and other big Chinese cities? And how big a difference does it make? Welcome to this special edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. I'm delighted to be joined by five such students from Xinjiang who can share with us their experiences. And let's meet them. They are Nadira from Beijing University of Chemical Technology and um, Donur, student from Capital Normal University, Yulgur from Nanjing Audit University, Pasha Gül from Central University of Finance and Economics, and last but not least, Muna Waj from the Beijing Wuzi University. Welcome to The Point. <laughs> now, I understand that you all come from the city of uh, Artux, which is a county-level city and capital of the Kyrgyz Autonomous Region of uh, Kizilsu in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And you're about the same age, 22. I would like to ask you to each say a few things about yourself and then we can start our discussion. Let the audience know you. How about that? Uh, shall we start with you, Nadira? My name is Nadira from Beijing University of Chemical Technology. I'm a sophomore law student. I was born in a village in southern Xinjiang. The conditions there were very hard when I was a kid. Later, when I was six years old, I was supported by some kind-hearted people and went to study in the city to receive a better education. Step by step, I've been able to come to Beijing for college. We look forward to hearing more of your story about your um, um, schooling experience, especially in a city like uh, Beijing. Thank you. How? The Nurse. Hello everyone, my name is Dil Noor and I'm from Xinjiang as well. I'm studying here at Capital Normal University in Beijing. I'm also a sophomore student. I come from a remote village in southern Xinjiang. My family has five children and I'm the oldest. In 2005, our sponsors came to Xinjiang and saw the educational environment there and the deep-rooted patriarchal beliefs, so they funded 50 girls to go to school in the city. Because of this opportunity, the course of my life has changed. Now I've become a university student in Beijing, which has greatly broadened my horizons. Okay, you're um, good. Nice to meet you all. My name is Urgula, and I'm studying economics at Nanjing Audit University. Like them, I'm also from Atu, Xinjiang. Our hometown is known as the place where you can see the latest sunset in China. The scenery there is very beautiful, but when we're in school, the conditions were relatively backward and poor. With the help of the Beijing Meijian Education Foundation, I was able to attend elementary school in our city, just like my friends here. The government also has a policy for us to receive secondary education in more developed areas of the country. Then I went to Shihezi for middle school and Tianjin for high school. Now I'm in Nanjing. I'm grateful to these kind-hearted people and the government for their help. Because of them, we were able to get out of the countryside and attend college. Okay, Pasha Q. 
My name is Pasha Gulaji and my Mandarin name is Huang Huang. I was also supported by the Meijiang Education Foundation from elementary school to university in Beijing. I'm the youngest child in the family. My parents are almost 60 or 70 years old. My elder brothers and sisters didn't receive higher education. They only made it to middle school. The Meijiang Foundation helped me to get to college, which has changed the fate of our family. My name is Munawel Ilum, and my Mandarin name is Li Mina. I am now a sophomore year student from the Department of Economists at Beijing Wuzi University. Like everyone else, I've been supported by the Meijiang Education Foundation since 2005. Now I'm studying at a university in Beijing. I remember when Ms. Wang first reached out to me in 2005. I was still in elementary school. At that time, I could not speak a word in Mandarin. There was only one idea in my mind, and that was, I must go to school in Beijing in the future. I remember in Chinese class, the teacher asked me to answer a question. She asked, what is your dream? I replied that I wanted to study in Beijing. My Mandarin was not very good then, and everyone laughed at my accent. From then on, I said to myself that I must go to Beijing. With the support of Ms. Wang and the government's policies, I'm here now. This is also the reason why I insisted on studying in Beijing when I applied for college. Okay. I understand uh, Wang Nanai is uh, Ms. Uh, Wang Xiaomei, who uh, yeah. is the founder of the Meijiang Foundation. Um, I, I think our audience must really be curious about the fact that you can speak such good Mandarin Chinese. So I want to hear a little bit more about that. <laughs> I'll answer the question. We received education in the local Uyghur language in my home village, and then Mrs. Wang took us from our hometown, out of the countryside, to a primary school in the city, where we were provided with better food, accommodation, and learning facilities. So that, that school is also in the city of Artuks, yes. right? Okay. We went to a primary school in Artuks, we learned Mandarin from scratch in the first grade. The teachers assigned to our class were very professional. Mm. So was it like, so before that, you were learning Uyghur language at home yes. or in school as well, but nobody was teaching you Chinese. Right? Why not? We had teachers who taught us Mandarin, but not all subjects were taught in Mandarin Chinese. Back then, we only learned Mandarin as a second language. Most of our textbooks were still in the Uyghur language. Okay. So why do you think um, it is important? Do you think it is important to study Mandarin? as not as a secondary language but as a very important even main language yes. you know i think learning mandarin is very important because china is getting more and more influential and even many foreigners are learning mandarin as a chinese person i feel like we must learn this language well only through this can we adjust to life in big cities so in xinjiang is it also important that you speak Han it's also important in Xinjiang, especially now. Students can learn Mandarin from kindergarten. They learn the language from an early age. No matter where it is, Mandarin Chinese is the most important language because it is spoken nationwide. I've learned Mandarin since I was a child and now I feel like I'm more knowledgeable than those who haven't learned it. I can understand more about Chinese history and culture and become a better person. So I think learning Chinese is very important. How about the Uyghur language? Now that you, because some people would be asking, well, you're studying the Mandarin, Putonghua so much, you spend so much time. What about the Uyghur language? Ms. Wang considered this when she started to sponsor us in elementary school. 
We learn Mandarin Chinese and our native language at the same time. We certainly will not forget our mother tongue. Hmm. So, uh, among friends, with your family, you also speak Uyghur, yes. Yes. and you also can read and write mm. in, in the Uyghur language, but you can also use Putonghua to write, to read, to speak, to understand, and uh, all of that. What about your families? Do they think it is also important for you to learn Putonghua well? When we were young, we learned Uyghur first, because Mandarin Chinese was not as popular in 2005. We learn it as a second language, but now it has become more popular and children can learn it from an early age. Hmm. Our parents are now almost 50 years old and are still learning Chinese. Why do they, uh, why are they learning? They feel it's very necessary. In our daily life, we need to know some Mandarin to relate to other people. Like my dad, he sells mutton. He didn't understand Mandarin at all at first. When we came to Beijing in 2014, he came with me. Here's a story. There was a foreigner who spoke Mandarin Chinese to him, and he couldn't answer. He was very upset and told me that even foreigners can speak Mandarin Chinese, and I'm Chinese, but I don't even speak the language. My father then asked me to teach him. Later, I started to teach him little by little. But when I graduated from middle school, I went to Tianjin for high school. One day he called me and said, today I sold some mutton to a Han person, and we communicated in Mandarin Chinese. He felt particularly happy. He also decided to send my two sisters to attend bilingual classes. Now my two younger sisters can communicate with me fluently in Mandarin when I'm back home. Um, would you be worried that some of your Uyghur traditions might be lost? No, I think that's innate, and we definitely won't forget it. Although we're all learning Mandarin Chinese, and teaching it has become more widely practiced, we certainly will not lose our mother tongue. While learning Mandarin, we will develop our own culture as well. Um, let me ask you about your experience going to high school here uh, in the big cities such as Beijing or uh, in other places. Uh, what was the first impression? What was the most difficult thing? Have you gotten over it? I'd never been out of Xinjiang before. When I first arrived in inland cities, I didn't know that cities could be so big. When we were at school, I didn't speak Mandarin Chinese very well, and whenever I was in class, I was very afraid that the teacher would ask me questions, and my classmates would laugh at my poor Mandarin. Later, as I communicated more with my friends at school, my Mandarin Chinese also gradually improved. Uh, any other stories? There are many difficulties. But since coming here, everyone has been really nice to me. Like my math teacher in college. He would talk to me from time to time after class and check to make sure I understood all the course's content. If I had any questions, he would take extra time to explain. So I think that everyone is very helpful, and I can deal with any problems. Was it uh, anywhere um, difficult to interact with students from the Han nationality or from other regions of China? To me, it seems that it doesn't matter which ethnic group we all belong to. In the class, our teachers treat us all the same. So I can't feel any difference as an ethnic minority. We all get along very well. <laughs> there are some misunderstandings, but we all get along very well. We have six people in our dormitory, five of whom are local students in Beijing, and they're Han. I still remember my conversation with a Han student when I first transferred to their class. The first question to me was, do you ride horses to school in Xinjiang? I was shocked and I said, why would you think that? They said, because we think Xinjiang is a desert, so you must go to school on horses or camels. I said that life in Xinjiang is just like the life of inland people. You live in buildings and we also live in buildings. You go to school by car or bus and it's the same for us. I also explained many things to them, and now my classmates have a better understanding of Xinjiang. Our relationship is really good.
There are people who still think Xinjiang is very backward. This was the case decades ago. When I was transferred to an inland high school, students asked me, is there a building in Xinjiang? Lots of questions like this. They just think that Xinjiang is still very backward and hasn't developed that much. So what it is really like in Xinjiang? I mean, I have never been. I wanted to go all the time, but tell us a little bit. Just like other places, in Xinjiang there are cities, rural areas, counties, etc. There is no big difference between the life in Xinjiang and in other inland cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all the same. Okay, okay, Pasha, two of us. <laughs> when I was in high school, I studied in Fengtai, Beijing. To be honest, I think that my life here is similar to that in Urumqi. There aren't that many big differences in people's lives. We're so used to putting labels on places that we haven't been to or don't know much about. Usually the labels that people have in mind were formed years ago and haven't been updated since. The labels are outdated and we need to refresh our impressions. Um, people would be very interested to know uh, what's the level of development in your home country, for instance, your family, and what does what does it mean for you to get such education for your family, for your cities, you know, mm -hmm. for all of these students getting all of these help to get a better education. What would it mean for your family and for your city? It's hard to say how much we could bring back to our hometown, but I think at least we can make some contributions to improving the condition of our families after graduating from college. We can help our parents and share some family responsibilities. Are there any concrete things you think you can do when you go back to Xinjiang after, um, after you study chemical technology, but you're a lawyer too, right? You study law. I want to go back to work in Xinjiang and stay close to my parents in Atuk. Because I'm a law student, I probably will work in a court or a procuratorate. After receiving a better education in Beijing, I want to apply what I've learned to local development. Hmm. Will it be easy for you to find a job in those sectors, in the, in the, in the courts or as a lawyer? I think the chances are quite high. My hometown is prioritizing hiring college students who have graduated from inland universities with a better educational background. So I may have a better shot. In my case, my family's living condition is much better than years before. Under the government's policies, we've gotten out of poverty. All of my brothers and sisters are at school. I'm a history major, and my program is designed to prepare me to become a history teacher in the future. When I return to my hometown after graduation, I'll teach history to local students. I'll definitely do my best and help them to study in inland areas. I'll also encourage them to come back to develop Xinjiang after seeing the bigger world. Mm. Why did you want to choose history? History is an interesting subject. I can learn the history of my own country and understand how China has become what it is today. I can also learn about the history of other countries and find the similarities and differences in their development. In this way, I can better understand China and the world at large. Will you be teaching history in Putonghua or in Uyghur uh, language or in both? I'll use Mandarin because I've studied history in Mandarin Chinese. If I want to teach in Uyghur, I must learn all the professional terms first. It will be quite challenging for me to teach these terms in Uyghur, so I'll choose to teach in Mandarin. Okay, okay, Uyghur. 
In my case, the living condition of our family has also improved significantly in recent years. My dad sells mutton, and since there's an interest-free loan, my dad applied for this loan. He then started raising sheep himself, which is like direct sales. <laughs> Our family has 20 sheep now and applied for an interest-free loan of 30,000 yuan. My grandpa died when my father was only seven years old, so my father had to start the business from scratch when he was very young. We've benefited a lot from this policy. Our family recently moved to a new house and got subsidies from the government. Also, we didn't have a heating system before, but this year all the houses in our neighborhood have been provided with heating systems. The economic situation is much better than before. As for me, I'll go back to Xinjiang. The government has sponsored us to receive better education in inland cities and has invested so much in us. There are many people from inland regions coming to Xinjiang, and they support local development every year. We studied in the inland cities for so many years. When it comes to Xinjiang's local development, we students can make contributions to our hometown and help the central government reduce some pressure. This will also help reduce the government's fiscal expenditure. I'm majoring in economics, but I have my own plans for my future career. I want to start my own business in agriculture, specifically in the modernization of agriculture. In my opinion, the agricultural sector in Xinjiang has plenty of room for development. In fact, the integration of agriculture, the internet, and artificial intelligence is still a major area for research. For instance, in the past, my dad used to apply pesticides and fertilizers by himself, but I could find more efficient and modern tools for agricultural production, like drones. I also studied economics. To be specific, I study international trade. I'm now studying finance in Beijing, but I want to return to Xinjiang in the future. All those students with this major will have better career prospects if they stay in large cities. I will still go back. I have benefited from the government's favorable policy and received secondary education in more developed areas. The country has supported us for more than seven years. I think after receiving such a good education, it's necessary for us to return to Xinjiang and use the knowledge we have learned to develop our hometowns. Okay. In recent years, Xinjiang has developed very well. Every year when I go back to our hometown, we feel something new is happening. For example, the roads in our villages used to be pretty muddy when we were young, but now our villages has built asphalt roads, like War Guler just said. Now, with the government's help, every house has installed proper heating systems. Affordable and subsidized houses have also been provided to each family. The changes are quite big and the economy is doing quite well. However, I feel that if Xinjiang wants to achieve further development, it still needs a lot of talent coming in to lead and guide this region like us after studying here for so many years and learning a lot of things i felt the need for us to go back and give it back to my little village or greater xinjiang i also want to apply what i've learned and what i've seen here to our local community to help it develop so as we wrap up uh, i would like to really hear some Uyghur language or Uyghur um, song or that you can think of. Maybe we can say Happy New Year in, in the Uyghur language. Who would like to give it a try? I'll say Happy Chinese New Year in Uyghur. It's very short. Mm, I wouldn't try to imitate it. <laughs> I won't be able to. Uh, how about a song? Maybe a song that people sing in this time of the year? Can you think of something? Okay, ma. Okay. All right. 
Uyanığa taşlap oynasın, bu yanığa taşlap oynasın. Laçığa asqan lintisini, yanığa taşlap oynasın. Laçığa asqan lintisini, yanığa taşlap oynasın. Şey 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 şey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Time goes really fast. Thank you so much for coming to the show. And thank you for having followed us on this very special edition of The Point. I've been joined by five Uyghur students studying here in big Chinese cities such as Beijing and Nanjing. As usual, I'll see you next time on CGTN.